Welcome back class. So we discussed our gram positive bacteria. Now it's time to discuss our gram negative bacteria. We'll start with our phylum proteobacteria, which is the largest group we'll talk about. These are all chemoheterotrophic. That means they need an outside source of sugar or some sort of food source to give them both energy and to give them carbon to build their, their own materials. All proteobacteria are related. They all came from a common ancestor. Um, a little interesting fact about the Greek god Proteus that they're named after. Um, but there are five classes within the proteobacteria. And these are named after the Greek alphabet. So there's alpha proteobacteria, beta proteobacteria, gamma proteobacteria, delta proteobacteria, and epsilon proteobacteria. So first we have alpha proteobacteria. These are bacteria that although they are chemoheterotrophic, they're able to grow where there are very low levels of nutrients. They form these little stalks or buds. Those are called prosthecae. Within them, the genuses rhizobium and bradyrhizobium are important agriculturally because they help fix nitrogen. So nitrogen is very abundant in the air around us, but in the air around us, it is completely unusable for plants and animals. So bacteria take that nitrogen from the air and convert it into forms that are usable for plants. There are also some that are pathogenic to plants and animals. This would include Rickettsia rickettsii, which causes Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which can be um, transmitted through insect vectors, and Bartonella hensili, which causes cat scratch disease, which can also be transmitted by insect vectors. Then beta proteobacteria are going to be found in places where there's anaerobic decomposition going on. So a tree has fallen in the water and it's starting to decay anaerobically. Um, and so those, as the, the, that organic matter is being broken down, it'll release things like hydrogen, ammonia, and methane. And the beta proteobacteria will use those. Um, within this class, we have spirillum, which are helical bacteria in here. Um, they have external flagella, which differentiates spirilla from spirochetes. There's also Neisseria meningitidis, which causes meningitis, Neisseria gonorrhea, which causes gonorrhea, and Bordetella pertussis, which is these pink ones, which causes whooping cough. Um, we will come back and talk about all three of those diseases the last week of class, um, but please do already be able to tell me this species causes this infection. Um, within beta, proto beta proteobacteria are also zooglia, which are important in, in sewage treatment processes. Then our gamma proteobacteria are the really large group within here. Um, it includes pseudomonas, which are opportunistic pathogens. They can create an infection known as hot tub rash. Coxiella brunettii, which causes Q fever. So it was named Q fever at the time because nobody knew what was causing this, um, these infections. It was a big question. So it got the name Q fever for question. Um, but this can be transmitted through aerosols and through milk. Legionella, which grows in warm water areas, so it can be found in streams and warm water pipes. Um, it causes a disease known as legionellosis, which is a type of pneumonia. Um, it's called this after a group of legionnaires, or a kind of a union group, was meeting in a hotel and the bacteria was growing within the pipes of the hotel's air conditioning. And as the meeting started and the air conditioning was turned on and the bacteria was aerosolized throughout the room and a bunch of legionnaires got very sick from it. So that's how we got that name. And Yersinia pestis, which causes plague or black death. Yes, that plague, that one that you know from European history. Um, this is a disease that still exists. It can be carried by rats and ground squirrels. It is still endemic in the southwestern United States. And every year there will be a few cases around California, Nevada, New Mexico. Um, fleas are able to transmit it to animals and to humans. So it is a flea bite that causes the plague. Um, something interesting that I learned about the plague is that um, in you know the 1300s, 1400s, um, they didn't know yet what was causing the plague. But they knew that places that had a lot of cats seemed to have a lot of the plague. And so they thought, well, maybe it was the cats that were carrying it around. Um, and 
one town ordered the um, all cats to be annihilated, to be removed from town, or they would be sacrificed. Um, and seemed like a kind of good idea because there was evidence that cats were around where this was happening. Um, but what they saw was plague actually, th the numbers of plague victims jumped because cats were not what were causing the disease. Cats were the predator of the rats. So where the rats were going with the fleas, that's where the disease was being carried. The cats were chasing, following the rats because that's what cats do. And so without that predator, the rat population boomed and the amount of plague boomed. Um, so I like that story as an example of trying to do, it's so, it's, they so were trying to do good science. They were trying to collect data and they were trying to understand what it meant. But sometimes, sometimes it doesn't mean what, what it looks like it means at first glance. Okay, then we have the enterics. These are a type of gamma proteobacteria. We've used that word enterics or coliforms in lab before. These are bacteria that inhabit the intestinal tract. And within the intestinal tract, they're going to ferment carbohydrates. Um, they're mainly gram-negative rods that are um, facultative anaerobes. They include E. coli. Um, e. coli is a normal part of our GI tract. Although one cerevar, E. coli 0157H7, is able to cause traveler's diarrhea. So it's picked up an extra toxin that it's able to produce. Shigella causes dysentery. Um, the difference between diarrhea and dysentery is diarrhea is um, watery, but dysentery is bloody. So dysentery is bloody diarrhea, um, sometimes known as shigellosis. Vibrio, which are, you're familiar with that term vibrio to describe a shape, those slightly curved rods. Um, these are found in coastal waters. Um, there were a lot of cases along like the Mississippi River Valley as um, the country was being um, explored. Um, it causes, Vibrio cholera causes cholera, which is another profuse and watery diarrhea. And then salmonella, which is pathogenic, um, both salmonella enterica and salmonella typhi. Salmonella typhi causes typhoid fever. Um, and there are 2,400 cerevars within this. Let's talk about what cerevars means. A cerevar is a variation within a species. So they have slightly different antigens on different parts of the cell. They're still at its root, the same bacteria. It still makes the same toxins. It still has the same disease it produces, but it just has slightly different antigens. And um, those antigens could, could relate to what's on the capsule. It could respond to antigens on the bacterial cell wall, or it could correspond to antigens on bacterial flagella. Then Delta proteobacteria are kind of cool. It makes me think of like a little chihuahua who doesn't know he's so little, but he's barking at all the big dogs. Um, so Delta proteobacteria are little curved bacteria that will predatorize other bacteria. So you can see this little one is much smaller than the big blue one, but it doesn't care. It's going to go yap at it and eat the blue one for lunch. Um, so a Della vibrio is this bacteria that's able to attack other gram-negative bacteria. That word Della means leech because it's going to leech on there. Um, it will be able to, to multiply by elongating and then spiraling into fragments. And delta, delta proteobacteria are also important to contribute to the sulfur cycle. Then epsilon proteobacteria are mainly microaerophilic, helical, and curved. It includes Campylobacter. Um, C. fetus causes spontaneous abortions in domestic animals. So that would be important on a ranch with, you know, cows and, and horses and sheep. And C. jejuni, which causes a foodborne intestinal disease. And Helicobacter, that's what this picture is. He always looks like he should be playing the steel drums or something. I love this image. Um, it has multiple flagella. You can see all these flagella. One in particular that we care about is H. pylori, which is associated with peptic ulcers and stomach cancer. Um, its presence is related to an increase in peptic ulcers, and there's some debate about its impact on stomach cancer. Some research shows that it, it is more likely to have stomach cancer when it's around, some that it's less likely. Um, it's able to grow in the stomach. The stomach is a very, very acidic place, so it produces... Um, an enzyme called urease that can neutralize gastric acid. So 
in turn, the gastric acid will not be so acidic and it'll be a more um, suitable place for H. pylori to grow. So now you can tell me about the alpha proteobacteria, the beta proteobacteria, the gamma, the delta, and the epsilon proteobacteria that we just talked about. I will see you back for our next lecture where we're going to talk about our non-proteobacteria. Let me know if you have any questions.